We've all seen hundreds of bug bounty reports and we know that bug bounty can look very easy. But how does a life of an actual full-time bug bounty hunter look like? To find this out, I interviewed Justin Gardner, who's one of the best hackers out there participating in multiple life hacking events, who became full-time hunter about four years ago. Trust me, you do not want to miss this episode. Enjoy the interview. Hello, Justin. Thank you so much for, for joining me in today's podcast. Um, for those of you who don't know Justin, he's a host among being a great background hunter. He's the host of the Critical Thinking Bug Bounty podcast. And I want to thank you and Joel as well for creating such a fantastic resource. I think it's like the literally the best resource about bug bounty at the moment. So, so huge, uh, that's, huge thanks for this. That's awesome, man. Thank you. And <laughs> Yeah, of course. It's it's great to be on the pod, man, and uh, it's it's fun actually being on the flip side of this of this <laughs> scenario, right? Like normally, normally I'm the one, you know, being like, "Hey, thanks for joining me on the pod and and carrying the conversation." So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna sit back today <laughs> and uh, and answer some questions and relax. Should be yeah, fun. Yeah, easy, e almost easy job. Actually, it will be me just asking questions and and listening to you, and you will do all the hard work this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> um, okay, for, for those those viewers who don't know you, they know they have to check critical thinking. But after this podcast, and for now, can you please talk us through your background? How do you, how did you start with hacking? Sure, man. Um, yeah. So the background for me was uh, well, I'm I'm particularly blessed in that I knew what I wanted to do for my job ever since I was like 12 years old. Oh, wow. So, and that all goes back to one day when uh, I was working or I was, uh, you know, playing my, my, my games when I was 12. And a guy uh, from my church actually came over when my internet stopped working because I was like super, I was in the middle of a game and the internet just dropped. And I was like, oh, this is terrible. And a, a, guy, a guy came over and he fixed my internet. Um, and he did that by typing into a little command line, you know, the little black box command line terminal. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, it, it worked again. And he typed like ipconfig slash release ipconfig renew and, uh, and, you know, just reset the, the lease there and, um, and it worked. And I was like, whoa, okay, hold on. I got to learn how to do that. Um, so I started uh, Googling around and I started uh, bothering him every week at church. <laughs> I'd be like, hey, teach me how to do this. Teach me how to do this. Um, and so that was where the interest really started. But that was just IT. So as I started, you know, learning more about computers, I uh, started getting into programming. And as I started getting into programming, I started to get into hacking. Um, and at that time, I, it was largely me writing hacking tools in Python because I really liked Python. Um, and I was the moderator of a, of a forum uh, called Hack Forums, uh, I was of the Python section of that. And um, that was really fun. Uh, and so I, I guess from there, it kind of, my interest sort of grew. I did, had my little stint on the, on the dark side of hacking. Um, and, uh, you know, went a little bit down that path, but, uh, after, after I decided that wasn't where I wanted to be ethically, I switched, um, over to more focusing on programming for the next couple of years. And then after that, I, uh, went to college and restarted my hacking journey, which is where I got acquainted with Bug Bounty. Um, and the, the story behind that is really interesting. And I've actually, I think I've talked about this once or twice before, but um, that journey actually started for me with uh, a guy named Tommy DeVos, the doggy G. Uh, many, many people know him in the community. And he just kind of rolled into my cybersecurity club that I was teaching one day and uh, started telling me about Bug Bounty. I didn't even know he was gonna come, and like I was in the middle of teaching a lecture on, on how yeah. to like hack something on Metasploitable, and he just rolls in. He's like, "Yo, what's up?" In, in the middle of the lecture, and I'm like, "Hey, how's it going?" He's like, "You guys want to pop some of these systems?" And he's pointing at these live computers. I'm like, "Okay, who are you?" You know, um, and he proceeded to tell me about Bug Bounty, and that's that's kind of when my life changed. And I did a little stint in. Um, in uh, like pen testing consulting, uh, you know, before I jumped straight into full-time bug bounty, but 
really from that moment on, from from that moment that uh, Tommy DeVos introduced me to it, I've been really captivated by Bug Bounty. And uh, one question be before we continue, where does your nickname come from? Sure. Yeah, man. Uh, I get that question a lot. And actually, Franz was kind of making fun of me at, at the last event. He, he put an emoji <laughs> of, like, of like a person thinking and then a rhinoceros and then like B plus or something like that. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm rating rhinos like at, on a scale of, you know, F yeah. to A plus or whatever. But actually, um, the name comes from a video game that I used to play. Uh, called Ratchet and Clank, and in that game, there's a gun called the Rhino Blitzerator. And being the weird 12-year-old that I was when I came up with this, uh, I decided to take the only cool part of that name out of it <laughs> and remove <laughs> and remove Blitz from it, and then just stick with Rhino Raider. So that's where that's where it came from. No correlation at all to rhinoceroses. <laughs> okay, but well, it's a nice, nice, catchy nickname and thanks, man, and the cool story behind it as well. Um, so you worked for, for a few years as a pen tester. What were the things that attracted you in Bug Bounty that you didn't like in pen testing, maybe? Yeah, man. Um, well, I, I really enjoyed my stint uh, as, as a penetration tester. I worked for a great company in Wisconsin called Synercom, S-Y-N-E-R-C-O-M-M. -M. Um, and they're a great company. I, I really enjoyed working with them. I enjoyed the, the, the management and the whole flow. But the thing that really pulled me away was the flexibility, you know? Like, at the end of the day, if you're not working for yourself, you'll never have complete flexibility, and that's what I wanted. So um, when Mariah and I were getting ready to move to Japan, which we did in 2020, uh, I, I forced myself to move out of my comfort zone a little bit and leave that job and um, go full-time bug bounty because the financials were where they needed to be for that. And and that that um, I, I I was definitely a little anxious about it at the time, but with Mariah's support, we were able to do it. How did you prepare to to quit a nine to five job? Well, you know, um, I'm pretty risk averse as a person. I, I'm kind of growing a little bit more away from that now, but um, I was r really not attracted to the idea of not having a consistent income. Um, and so for me, it looked like saving up a lot of money uh, to make sure I had enough runway. So essentially, Mariah and I said, okay, we're going to save up. We're going to make sure that we have enough money to live in Japan for a year um, without making any money at all off of Bug Bounty. But at that point, I was already making more money off of Bug Bounty than I was making at my full-time job. Um, yeah. And so, you know, it, it, it made it made sense that if I made the switch, I would be making at least that much, uh, if not more. So uh, that, that sort of confidence, um, you know, running those numbers, getting that runway in place, um, that, was a, that was a good thing for me. Yeah, and a, a lot of people mentioned the uh, um, unpredictable income as one of the biggest cons of being a full-time bug bounty hunter. How do you manage this now? Yeah, well, now it's a little bit more, I'm a little bit more comfortable with the whole situation. So um, I don't manage it as um, strictly as I did before. But one of the best ways to manage this, and I talked about this on the last podcast that we did at Critical Thinking um, with uh, Rennie Pack, is you can take some money, put it in a business account, right? Do bug bounty part time until you build up, you know, however much you need in your, in your business account. And then just decide, all right, I'm going to pay myself out you know, 5K, 10K, 15K a month, whatever it is, um, it, from this account to my bank account, just like I had a normal job, you know? And if you have enough runway in there in advance, if you've got, you know, let's say if it's 5K, if you've got, you know, 30 grand, $30,000 in there, then um, you'll, you know, you've got six months of runway of paying yourself without ever having to earn any money. And that's, that should be pretty stabilizing, I think. Yeah, yeah, I did a similar thing. Mm. When I was quitting my job, mm. the way I thought about it is I have one year of worth of living in my savings. Mm. Yeah. And I treated every single, let's say, every single thousand was uh, a few days uh, longer that I didn't yeah. have to come back to employment. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then you pop bugs like that 20K S3 bucket <laughs> thing, and then you, you extend that runway a lot. Yeah, it extends a lot. I, I don't even know how, how long it is now, but, but at least <laughs> I, I do feel comfortable. That's good. And uh, one, more, one more thing about the, the full-time bug bounty. 
yeah. what are the things that make you reconsider your decision and make you want to be just employed again and don't yeah. care about a lot of things well dude you're asking me this question at a pretty at a pretty like rough time actually for me because I've, i've been sitting you know uh and thinking for the past couple of days i'm coming off of a trip to japan and off a trip to portugal for some life hacking events and i'm just kind of now getting back into my swing and um Actually, when you asked me to prepare for this, you know, podcast, you asked me to grab some stats on like my my bug bounty reports and that sort of thing. And um, while my income is on track this year, uh, I'm realizing that I'm not really a full time bug bounty hunter this year. This year, yeah. I'm a full time live hacking event participant. <laughs> is oh. essentially what's happening. Uh, it 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 like looking back over my my. Um, reports, they are very much largely clustered around the live hacking events. And then after that, I take a break. Or uh, as I mentioned on the pod before, I do real estate stuff on the side. So this year in January, we bought a rental property and I've been fixing that up, you know, going there, you know, hammering stuff and like <laughs> drilling stuff and that sort of thing. Um, and we just finally finished that. So I haven't been quite on top of it this year. Um, but And and that that makes that affects the confidence a little. Like it, it, I'm still doing all right in the live hacking events, but I, when you're not staying in the requests, you know, every single day, and you're not getting as much time. And I think it's also coupled with the fact that I've been doing critical thinking, which takes time. Yeah, um, you know, I'm just not as in the in the request as I used to be. You know, and um, and so that's something that I, I'm taking steps to fix. But in the meantime, it feels a little bit like you know. That that feeling starts to creep back a little bit. That familiar feeling of like, ah, oh, man, is this really the right the right choice for me? And and I, I know I'm ranting here, but I actually do have one other thing um, regarding full time bug bounty. I think it's it's really tricky to be self employed and to rest properly um, because I, I find it really hard for me to say, all right, six o'clock, and then I'm done. You know, if I've got stuff that I need to do. Um, yeah. And and so yesterday it was a beautiful fall day, and uh, you know I, I got the hot tub in the backyard, and I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna grab a drink, be done with work, grab a drink, you know, Mariah's coming with me. We go sit out in the hot tub, you know, drink the drink, look at the beautiful fall colors, and I and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, man, this is great, but why am I still feeling a little? anxiousness in my chest you know and I know it's it so well man. <laughs> it, it's it's bad man and and so it takes a lot of mental effort and a lot of mental and i so i sat there in that moment and i said hey breathe like you have enough time to do the work that you need to do you have enough income to survive why are you stressing out there's no reason right and uh and some some so sometimes you just got to take a take a breath breathe through it And and meditate on that fact that that everything is fine and and you don't need to you know worry about all these little little details. But and and that I didn't have that problem before when I was employed traditionally when I had a consulting job because at the end of the yeah. day I'd clock out and I'd be like, well, somebody else's problem now, you know. <laughs> so it, it's definitely different and and that those things like that do make me question the decision a little bit every once in a while. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to relax without to, to like fully relax for me yeah. i think sports is 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 great because then i i'm literally so into the whatever activity i am doing that i can't even think think this yeah yeah uh, but I, I, it's definitely I, difficult i play i play volleyball every week i was playing volleyball oh, nice. until like midnight last night and it's great but for me i just like you know that's not That's not rest, you know. It, it's different. It's okay, it's yeah. mental rest, but sometimes not even mental rest, you know, because it's like it's like there's a lot of strategy that goes into volleyball, and I'm a very I'm a very competitive person, <laughs> and so uh, you know when I'm playing volleyball, I'm like in the zone, you know. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I think tr trying to figure out how to have strict boundaries with yourself, and actually, here let me let me show you one other trick. Yeah. Uh, for those of you listening on. Um, Uh, I'm sorry, but I'm going to show something on the screen here for YouTube. This is a sign that my wife got me, and this says in Japanese, "Open for business," and this one says, uh, "Closed" or or like you know, uh, planned days off essentially. And and when I'm when I'm working, I flip the sign to in, in you know in business, 
And when I'm done working, <laughs> I flip the sign to it's rest time, you know? Yeah. And so that smart. does help me sort of mentally segregate. All right, I need to um, be done with work now and I need to stop letting it invade my thoughts and invade my, my stress, you know? Yeah, it's so smart because it, it, being self-employed just cr creates a lot of problems like this that you are not even thinking about, about when you are quitting. When you're quitting, yeah. you're thinking about, will I make enough money? Mm -hmm. I, I will be able to travel and, and you just don't, don't think that, oh yeah, this might be a problem that I don't know where should I finish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's rough, man. And also taking time off, you know, like I, I, I take a decent amount of time off, I do, but I feel like I'm not taking very much time off because, um, you know, even when I'm taking time off, it's like, well, you know, things aren't going on without me, you know? And so it, it's a little bit, it, until you get some employees in, in your business that are actually keeping business running, it sort of stops when you're a solo yeah. entrepreneur. And that's, that's a little bit, that's a little bit stressful too. So taking time off and finding time to rest after work hours, I think is difficult as an entrepreneur. Yeah, and we have to play volleyball when we meet at any life hacking events. Heck I started yeah. playing this year after not oh, really? playing for, for years because I was, I was in Tenerife doing the digital no one thing and mm -hmm. the, the, there was a nice group of, of people playing volleyball and I started loving the game back uh, after so many years of break and, and now I, I try to play like once in a week. I love the beach volleyball, but, ah. but I play indoor as well. Yeah, dude, I love volleyball. I, it's always been, you know, ever since I, I started playing in a rec league when I was like 16, it's been my favorite sport by far. It's just this perfect combination of like, it's very clutch. You know, it, there's lots of very, there's very like dangerous situations where you can like kind of barely survive, you know, and dive and get the <laughs> ball back over the net. And it's also yeah. very collaborative. You know, you have to work with a team. Um, and there's nothing more gratifying than like, being a hitter and then seeing that set go up and it's a beautiful set and you're like, Oh, I'm about, about to crush yeah. that, you know? <laughs> and, and, and then just boom, you know, I, I love it. I love it. Yeah. I feel when I, when I jump, when I get the timing correct and I jump w when I shoot, I just yeah. feel just before, before the attack, I just feel it will be a good one. <laughs> oh yeah, dude. I love that feeling so much. <laughs> and then I'm blocked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, that happened last night. I got such a good swing in and somebody just boop locked it down bummer yeah okay let, let's let's get back to hacking uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, attacking attacking both is nice but how do you attack web applications what's your hacking style uh, yeah you know I, I find this question really hard to answer because um it, it it's a pretty abstract question and I, I kind of put some thought into it and i think the biggest thing for me is actually understanding the application and understanding how users use the application so um, first thing I do when I get into an application is I, I, I get excited and then I think I'm, I'm about to start hacking stuff and I start looking at the requests and sometimes I'll like read the JavaScript files right off the bat. And then I almost always catch myself about five minutes in and I'm like, okay, let's actually not try to hack something that we don't understand. And I go back and I, I, you know, put, I minimize my, my Kaido tab or my, or my burp tab or whatever and send it down to the bottom and where I can't look at it. And then I just use the application like a user. And I try to step through all the functionality in the application. I try to configure everything. Sometimes that means going and creating accounts on different services and linking those accounts to this service and importing data or, you know, filling out spreadsheets to, you know, populate data in the application, whatever it is. I take the time to do that for a little while. And then I, I go back and I start looking through the requests in Burp and I start working back through those same things, but with the, with, but with the window open, right? And, and that's when the bugs start rolling. But I think it's important first to use the application like a human um, and, and not necessarily just like somebody who's focused on hacking it. Um, How much time does this phase last, more or less? Uh, you know, normally about, normally less than an hour, I'd say, okay. um, you yeah. know, it, it, it depends on the size of the application, but, um, normally less than an hour. And then also, uh, I won't necessarily do this while I'm hacking, but I'll, I'll try to, uh, but sometimes it will. Um, 
but I often try to read the documentation too. And that's a great thing to do. Like, you know, if you have to go somewhere and you, you know, your wife is driving or something and you can just read the, <laughs> read the documentation on your phone or like you're waiting at a doctor's appointment or something like that. And, uh, and you know, you can just read the documentation and, um, and so that's when I'm feeling a little bit, or maybe I'm like burnout on hacking. My eyes don't want to look at the, the screen anymore. So I, I, you know, uh, throw the, the, uh, you know, documentation on my e-reader, my e-ink reader, and then go sit in the hot tub and read the documentation, you know? And so oh, it, wow. it, it, uh, it, it works, it works great for getting to know the application a little bit better. And, um, as we say on the podcast, getting intimate with the application, you know? Um, <laughs> Uh, and I think that's really important. I, I'm not much of a of a wide hacker. I don't do a lot of recon. Uh, I mostly just go to the main app and then hack it, sort of person. Do you take notes in when you're in the hot tub, for example? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I don't. I don't. Um, I, what I will do sometimes is I will record a voice memo, um, okay. and and then um, you know just kind of record and then pause and then go back to the documentation record pause go back to the documentation that sort of thing um, and then afterwards I'll either have that transcribed uh, by AI or I'll tra transcribe it myself or sometimes I'll send it to Mariah and she'll transcribe it for me um, uh, and and that that does help but normally while I'm hacking my notes are nothing more than naming my Kaido tabs <laughs> or something like that so <laughs> yeah and it, it's a very difficult question because you probably rely on your experience a lot, but what are you looking for in this first phase uh, when you're assessing the application? Yeah, man, um, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, you hit the nail on the head when you said you're relying on experience. And, and I think um, what's really important for a lot of people is building that experience, right? And the only way you build that experience is by failing. And so get out there, fail, look at the applications. But um, for me, I'm looking for anything that has an ID in the request, right? So I can try IDORs. I'm looking for data that's being reflected in the response. Specifically, I, in older applications, you can just kind of feel it where um, when they re reflect data into like a JavaScript block, like, like yeah. one of the things I see a lot is like a, a query parameter or a post parameter gets put inside a variable, so in, in JavaScript in the response, right? And that's just sketchy as heck. Um, yeah. and, and, and so, uh, you know, whenever you have those sort of situations, uh, definitely, look for, definitely look for XSS. I'm looking for places where URLs are being parsed. That's, you know, not, not great stuff. I'm looking for any um, uh, tokens or signed things, right? So I can see if I can manipulate any of that, trying to break out of that syntax. Um, what else am I looking for? Looking for any XML parsing or any, really any structured language parsing or, or any, any interactions with SDKs or, or other, other logical entities. You know, if you're, they're using a different um, website to do X, Y, Z, there's got to be okay. sort of a, an auth transition between those two things. And that's kind of where I'm looking. And then what are your favorite bug types that, that you go for most often? Favorite bug types. Well, lately I've been loving post message stuff. Um, oh. The post message stuff is really cool. Um, and there's a lot of uh, untapped attack surface there. Um, so I really like that. Um, to be honest, man, I, I think my, my favorite bugs are the ones that are irregular. You know, the ones that are not your IDOR, your SSRF, your RCE, your straightforward, you know, just like command injection or anything like that. It's something that like, all right, I like inject it into this token and this token like gives me half auth into this other app. And then like with that half auth, I found like this one little weird endpoint in the API that I can hit that just like leaks everything, you know, it, it, that, that sort of stuff is a lot more. In, engaging or a lot more exciting to me now than like, ah, look at this, I found an idol or, you know, this sort of, sort of thing. Yeah. And I know that you, you are probably the most famous user of Kaido. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what sort of, do, do you spend all the time in Kaido or do you use both Burp and Kaido? What, how does yeah, it look I, like? I use both right now. Um, I would like to switch fully to Kaido. Um, and I, I use Kaido, uh, normally until I need to use burp. 
Uh, yeah. But there are still a couple features mi missing with Kaido, and I think a lot of this will be solved when Kaido implements upstream proxies, which is coming out very soon. Um, I think and, you released a, a podcast like two hours ago when we record this. Yeah, so, Kaido. so there's lots of lots of good data in there about about Kaido. Um, and, but yeah, they're going to be implementing upstream proxies soon, which will allow you to to chain Kaido with Burp and that sort of thing, which you can already do with Burp upstream oh, nice. proxies. But um, uh, you know, I prefer to use Kaido as as the main one, and then um, I'm using Burp primarily now for things like. Um, like quick collaborator callbacks if I need it, but really rarely that. Um, and then uh, for param miner and some of the plugins, that that's the main thing that I that I think I'm gonna uh, I'm missing in Kaido is like the plugin functionality that Burp has. Um, there are a couple other you know nice to haves, but at the end of the day, I'm working to transition my flow from Burp into Kaido and trying to grow with that product because I, I'm you know 100% certain that it will be taking over the market so yeah i think i think um there's a lot of room for for a different proxy right now cuz burp has so many functionalities and it's, and it's so great in many aspects mm -hmm. yeah but it's also bad in many aspects and and there's there's room for for competition and i think one way or another when we have competition uh we as users we are going to um to, to to win <laughs> when yeah. they yeah. when they fight for uh, for for the audience 100% man yeah I, I i totally agree and and no no disrespect to port swigger like i talk about kaido all the time but port swigger is a is a great company like they they yeah. do so much cool stuff with the port swigger academy and i love the port swigger research twitter channel and that sort of thing i just i feel like there are some things we've been asking for with burp for a while for them to solve the the structural issues and the um, you know how how much computing power is required to run it, and it's just not happening. So, it there's definitely space for someone else to to move into the the market, e even if it's just in the capacity of a lightweight HTTP proxy, right? You know, yeah. it doesn't just, necessarily uh, have to be everything. A lot of hackers like that's all they need. Like a repeater mm -hmm. is the main functionality, so uh, so something can work. Absolutely. What are some Burp extensions that you use most commonly? Um, burp extensions, uh, Param Miner. Param Miner is my go-to one. Let me just hold on. Let me just open it up here and see what I've got. Um, yeah. So Param Miner. Um, uh, I actually use copy as Python requests pretty often, you know, just to pop it out into a uh, into a like a Python file. Um, I use this great plugin called Request Minimizer, uh, which is super helpful. And essentially, what it does is you just click one button, and it sends the request like a bunch of times, and then it tells you which one, like which cookies, which headers, whatever, are necessary um, for you to uh for you to send the same to get the same response and that that's really helpful in allowing you to um identify what is actually doing something in in the in the situation right what what, what cookies are being used for auth what headers are being used for auth um you know what the csurf uh restrictions are actually being implemented that sort of thing so i use that one i i've got js weasel one here um uh Auto repeater is really cool too for if you're for doing if you're working on an app that does a lot of um, auth testing. Uh, so that one's really cool as well. What does auto repeater do? Yeah, auto repeater is really cool. Um, it it essentially allows you to automatically repeat requests. Um, and <laughs> okay, <laughs> ge okay <thank> genius. <laughs> um, and, and and so essentially, what it does is you define a set of replacements. Um, for example, if you want the cookies from uh, you know, another account subbed into the request, then it can do that and it'll automatically sub like C surf headers and that sort of thing if you set it up to do that. And then it'll repeat the request. And the reason why this is really cool is you can automate, um, I guess, uh, authorization testing. Uh, and so, you know, I just set up, all right, here are the cookies for my second account. Um, here's a C surf token that matches the cookies in the second account. And uh, every request that I do, it'll sub the cookies, sub the CSERF token in, and 
tell me whether I get a 403 or a 200 and, and log the response. Um, and it has a nice, you know, red, green sort of indicator to determine whether the request was successful or not. So if you're dealing with an app that has a lot of problems with uh, authorization, then this can really speed up your testing methodology because you won't have to send it to repeater, sub the cookies, sub the CSERF token yeah. every time. It'll just be done automatically. It sounds like very similar to authorize extension. Did you test both of them or? Uh, let me see. Yep, that's the one I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about Autorize. Okay. I have both of them uh, on next to it, okay. next to each other here. But yeah, that's the one that that's, <laughs> I'm actually talking about Autorize. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, Autorize is great. Yeah. I, I also use it. Um, you also said something about not reading JS files in the initial phase of, of testing the app, but when the time comes eventually to read the JS files, what are your, your tips to, to get the most out of them? Yeah, um, so JS files are really, really important. Um, they are one of the top ways, I think, to get intimate with an application. Um, and, 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 and so <laughs> in order to do that effectively, there's a couple really good tips. Um, and JS Re Weasel is implementing a lot of them. Uh, it's a really expensive software, and there are once again features missing, um, you know, from it that have prevented me from integrating it into my workflow, like full fledged. Um, but once it does complete those features, for example, a global search and a little bit more clean UI, I think it'll be huge. And the reason for that is because so many applications nowadays are using uh, Webpack to sort of. Um, encapsulate their their JS files, right? And um, you need to write a script to take the, uh, you know, map for that, which you can find in, in one of the files, and build out all the sub JS files that are lazy loaded and get all those as well. And then once you do, you can find a bunch of, you know, really cool endpoints in those. Um, and that's really the goal of it all, right? Is to look at the JavaScript files, look at the functionality that's there, or maybe used to be excuse me, used to be there, if it's commented out, and um, and try to see if those endpoints exist on the server side and whether you can recreate that, that functionality. Um, and and there's lots of different tricks to that, but the, the primary ones that I can think of now are look for, take a request that you, that you see going through Kaido or through Burp and um, send it to, you know, uh, send it to Repeater, look at the URL, and try to find the JS file or the JS code that initialized that request. Um, and then essentially look at the format, look at how that HTTP request is being uh, uh, issued. Maybe it's fetch, maybe it's you know uh, Ajax, maybe it's whatever. And then search for that same functionality, for that same code in all the JS files to see if you can enumerate all of the ways that um, requests are being sent in the application. And do you usually do this inside the browser, or like let's, let's say without the JS Weasel? Weasel? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I almost always okay. do. Um, and and there's some really big benefits of that, namely that you can set breakpoints and do dynamic analysis as well. Um, but yeah, I would like to do it in JS Weasel because it's nice to have some of the VS Code functionality. Um, but like I said, for me, it's just not quite there yet. I could see it getting there within the next six months for sure. Do you do you pay for this or did you um, tr tr use the free trial? Yeah, I've used the free trial and I, I, I told Charlie, I said, hey man, you know, trial's up. Uh, for right now, I don't think I'm going to be able to integrate it into my workflow, but implement these features and then I'm, if you can give me another trial, I, I would strongly consider buying this. Um, and okay. you, you get a, a lot of other big names in the industry, Shubs, uh, CDL, um, these guys are already using it, I believe, on a regular basis. So it's definitely a product to keep your eye on and something that very well might be worth $1,000 a year. Yeah, yeah, okay. Mm, so let's say you, you did all these things and three, four, five, six, seven, the whole day passes, you didn't find a bug. What's the moment when you say enough and you move on to another one? 
Dude, I'm not the guy to ask this question to because <laughs> I will not not move on until I found a, I find a bug, um, and then I will start grasping at at straws until I find something. Um, okay. in, in one of the latest life hacking events that I that I've been to, um, there's this particularly you know featureless application that we were supposed to hack, and everyone was like, "Yeah, this is really you know not much here," and um, and I just I just could not let it go until I found something. And then I found like some crazy like I won't give the details, but it, it was it was very much grasping at straws in the beginning, but turned into a pretty decent bug. Um, but yeah, for me, I think really it would have to be two weeks. Uh, you know, if I wasn't finding oh, wow. if I was like. I really do not like to let applications defeat me. <laughs> so uh, I, I would keep on digging as long as the bounties were there. You know, I'm not going to dive, you know, two weeks on a 5K crit program, you know. But as long as the bounties are there, you know, 1K for a medium, something for a high, and then, you know, above 5K, ideally 10, 10K for or above for a crit, then I'll definitely spend some time on that. You also said in, in uh, one podcast that when you started to spend more time on one application, you started finding fewer bugs, but more critical bugs. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's definitely true. I, I, I think that if you look at my reports from 2021 or, or 2020, um, a lot of my reports were, uh, you know, volume. They were uh, as many, you know, find every single IDOR, find every single XSS, you know, that sort of thing, right? Um, but then uh, as I started to look at it less as a, as a grind of ch checking every single endpoint, every single parameter, and looking at it more holistically from an application perspective, and saying, okay, where is the valuable data in this application? What are, are, the, are the core pieces of functionality? What are the fringe pieces of functionality that affect core pieces of functionality, like the developer API or something like that, right? Um, that's when I started finding more complex, more intriguing, and higher impact bugs, but less of them, for sure. Yeah, but overall, you are you're probably happy with finding fewer critical bugs. Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, and sometimes it doesn't work out that way. And sometimes you you know spend your time and you just find mediums and 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 lows and maybe a high or two. And that's that's somehow sometimes you know uh, how it goes. But uh, yeah, I, I'm always shooting for the higher impact and, and trying not to shy away from the complex topics as well. That that's another another tip is like. Um, if, if you read something in the documentation or you see something in an app and it looks complex and it looks difficult to hack, guess what? Every other hacker also thought that. And, and, and yeah. I bet you that the people that did the pen testing for that application also thought that and said, ah, you know, my 40 hours on this app are, are better spent elsewhere. Um, and there are often bugs there. The, the reason why I, I placed fourth in the integrity, the last integrity event was I focused on a more complex part of the of the um, scope, and was able to land two two bugs there that that paid out really well. So definitely a good tip there. Okay, so for example, how many programs did you hack for for at least at least a few days in the last let's say a month, excluding the period now where you prepared for the live hacking event? Yeah. Um, so let's take a look at that. I've got some data up here. Um, so I did some hacking on Bard, um, and that was really fun. And I did some live hacking event prep, and then I did one other program. Um, and that's, yeah, that's in the, in the last month. So about three programs. Um, and I guess... It's not a lot. Sometimes I go through free in one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, dude, I would never do that. <laughs> like, like I, I, I have to spend at least a couple days on a program. And, and for me, it's a little bit frustrating too because a program recently launched, right? And, and this is one I was hacking a couple days ago. And, um, you know, uh, it's new scope. And so it was just a bloodbath, right? There were vulns everywhere. <clears throat> and I got 
um, besides one crit and one high, I got all dupes. And the reason for oh. that was I'm, I'm slow to find the bugs. I mean, it, it's just kind of who I am as a hacker. Like, I'm not, I don't have that sixth sense that some people send, tend to have in that they go into the application and they just know right away where the bugs are, you know? Um, and sometimes it's luck, but there, there are some hackers that I know um, that, that really are just like, no, I wouldn't even test that because there's just not going to be bugs. I would test this place for bugs, and, and there's bugs there. And I'm like, what, what? And so I definitely am a little bit more methodical with my going in there, reading the docs, using the application like a user. But a lot of times that ends up, especially when there's no dupe window, uh, with me getting some, some dupes on the, on the more lower-hanging fruits. But I still got the crit in the high, which came from a little bit more in-depth application analysis. So. Yeah, and so when you want to spend so much time on a program that you choose, it must be a really thought out decision to, to hack on the program. So what are the factors that you consider when choosing your, your program? Yeah, uh, normally it's a live hacking event invite. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, to be frank, the past year it's been that. Um, but besides that, I really enjoy the Instacart program. We might have to bleep that. I don't remember if they're public or not. Um, okay. uh, and... Uh, th that program is great. I've enjoyed working with them and the bounties are where they should be. And uh, I'm a little bit more acquainted with the application, which is nice. Um, and then also I do look at the challenges and I do look at, um, you know, programs that are just launching. And if the bounties are enticing, then I'll go for those. And what that looks like for me is um, if the mediums, excuse me, if the uh, if the mediums are above seven hundred fifty dollars, so ideally I would like them at like a thousand. Um, some programs have mediums up to three thousand, which is really really nice. Um, and then if the crits are in the the, I say above five thousand, I really would like to see them above seven hundred or seven thousand five hundred now. Um, yeah. Uh, if if the crit is below. 7,500, it feels a little bit like not as rewarding because you can go to like, you know, companies like PayPal and get a medium and it's like eight grand, you know? <laughs> and so um, yeah. th that's kind of what I, what I look for. And do you spend more time on private or public bug bounty programs? Uh, definitely private. Private. And do you sort of, so when an in invite comes, comes to your inbox, and you evaluate the program, what are the metrics on, let's say, HackerOne that you look at? Do you look at the response time? Do you look at the leaderboard? Um, yeah, uh, so when I, first of all, when I get a program invite, there's, there's a lot of program invites that are coming, so I'm not really even assessing all of them nowadays. I just kind of, you know, click accept, click accept, click accept. <laughs> um, and, and then when I'm looking for a new program, I'm going to my, you know, opportunities tab, and I'm sometimes I'm sorting by you know most recent programs, and then I'll sort of read through those a little bit, um, and and I'll look at the bounty table like I mentioned, you know that sort of thing, um, and I'll look at the response statistics. Now my response statistics um, criterion has changed a little bit over the years. Uh, I used to like to see sub two week response time, and I still do, of course, but my standard has moved a little bit. Um, more lax to if they can get me the bounty in within a month i'm pretty happy with that um if there was a program that would pay <laughs> you know in two weeks then i think they would get a lot more engagement uh but times are changing and people seem to be a little bit understaffed in their security departments so some of my favorite programs that had a tr more traditionally fast response time aren't aren't keeping it up nowadays Okay, and do you have some programs that you come back over and over again? Yeah, Instacart's the one, man. Um, that's the one that I, I kind of go um, and uh, work on. Um, besides that, there are a couple uh, companies that are, have been running challenges iteratively. Um, you know, they run challenges on a pretty regular basis. Um, challenges being they'll launch new scope, they'll launch a new uh, product into scope um, and run a specific program for that. Um, that is capped at a specific amount of money. So, you know, they'll say, okay, we've got this challenge, it's new scope, it's capped at 25 grand or whatever. Um, so I'll, I'll, 
I'll normally try to participate in those if they're one of the couple ones that I really like. Um, but most of the time for me, it's live hacking event targets or Instacart. Okay, and let's say you come back to a program after after a year. Do you sort of start start from the beginning, like you never hacked here before? Or do you have something that you track changes? Do you check release notes? Yeah, I definitely uh, check release notes on my targets that I am aware of. Um, and that's always really helpful. I'm also doing this thing, and I, I don't think the script's running nowadays, but for like one or two targets. But uh, I will be picking up this thing again, where I, when I'm hacking on a target, and I, I did that sort of JS parsing, like I mentioned before, of like, all right, this is how endpoints are defined in the JavaScript files on this target, right? Um, I will set up an automation script to go to the HTML page that contains the dynamically generated JS file, extract the JS file name, open up the JS file, and then run a set of regexes on it and extract all the endpoints out. And then di yeah, that's so smart. diff that with a with a an old version of that that same data, and then alert if anything new pops up. So I'm getting alerted to new endpoints, new um, you know GraphQL queries and mutations. I'm getting um, alerts for sometimes even feature flags on the application, you know that sort of thing. Um, so those will allow me to be a little bit more reactive in my hacking and uh, go after some of those new features right as they come out. Yeah, that's so good. Like now I think about it, it's the, the best approach to diffing JS files that I've heard about. Mm. Uh, recently, there was a guy that found mm, two hacker one, mm. a report two hacker one about a, a, an idor in an unreleased feature. Yeah. And he did uh, maybe not similar thing, but he just extracted words from JS, JS files mm. and diffed them. Mm. But I think with, with your approach, with actually having a sort of tailored regex to a specific application, I think that's the most accurate approach to it that, that I've seen. Yeah, and I'll, I'll give some tips to um, people that are thinking about implementing the same thing. I don't know that I'll ever make my, my version of this open sourced, um, but if anybody is thinking about making the same thing, I would advise you to not try to make a one-size-fits-all system where you just like input a bunch of variables and then it does it, I would advise you to build a library um, a, that allows you to have some easier, uh, have an easier time building these scripts, but to build an individual script for every target. Because yeah. um, every target's gonna have uh, you know, a different structure, a different flow. Are you logging in, you know, automating a login and then going and grabbing a, you know, uh, HTML file that has a JS file in it, or are you doing that same thing, but when you grab the JS file, then you're extracting parts of the JS file and then building more JS files and going and getting those. You know, there, there's lots of um, different iterations for you to do a very thorough analysis of um, the JS files that the company is producing. And I think you're your best bet is actually just to write custom code for each and individual, uh, each every, each and every one, and have some tools in your toolkit that will allow you to do that effectively. Yeah, and from from the technical side, do you just run this script on your VPS or something? Yeah, I and you use maybe Slack notifications. Yeah, exactly. I I use um, a webhook and I just have it in cron tab on my on my VPS yeah. and it just runs every you know five minutes or ten minutes or an hour or whatever I decide. Um, and yeah, and, and the other cool thing about that is you get to know the company's release cycle too. So you, you'll see like, Hey, I'm getting notifications about this every Thursday at, you know, 6 PM or something like that. <laughs> so I bet they're pushing every Thursday at 6 PM, you know? And so that's, that's pretty cool as well. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, how often do you run it? Do you run it every hour? Uh, yeah, every hour, sometimes every five to 10 minutes, but uh, it, that's kind okay. of overkill. I, I would recommend doing it every, every hour. Okay, but do you think if someone does it every day, it's too, it's not enough? Um, no, not necessarily. You know, I just like to catch it as soon as I can catch it, right? Because it's a competitive okay. game. You know, we're we're looking to, um, you know, we're looking to beat other hackers to this to this scope. And who knows? The other hacker could just be, you know, 
wandering onto that program that day. And, uh, but you get, you got to react quickly if you want to be first to some of these things. So. Okay. Is it the only automation that you run these days? Yeah, that's pretty much it, man. Uh, everything else is manual. I, I, I just for, yeah, just for a little bit of history, I was a competitor in the, in the recon game for many years. Um, you know, I had my full setup with my, uh, you know, pulling from passive DNS sources, doing certs, you know, TLS certs and, and, uh, you know, brute forcing stuff and, and then, you know, doing subdomain takeovers and scanning mass for vulnerabilities. But for me, it got too much of a grind and I, I discovered that I was spending more time writing code than I was actually hacking stuff and I didn't like that very much. So um, when my bread and butter vulnerability type, the Route 53 takeovers, had a big um, sort of structural change that made them uh, more tricky to implement. They're still possible, I believe, but definitely trickier to implement. Um, then I said, all right, let me, let me try to pivot a little bit. And that's when I started doing a little bit more intentional manual hacking um, and looking for more impactful vulnerabilities. But I will say lately, I've been kind of thinking about flipping back to the other side for that same reason that we talked about, Greg, which is that um, if you stop working, you're, you're, nothing's happening, right? Yeah. And, and I was always comforted by the fact that when I wasn't working, when I had my auto, you know, automation set up running, that something was always searching for vulnerabilities. And sometimes I'd get that ping on my phone like, oh, something take takeover, you know? <laughs> Great, you know? And that, would, that was a little bit comforting. So I think, you know, maybe expanding this, this JS file monitoring that I'm doing uh, to more programs or getting back into the automation game just a little bit, scanning for a couple of different types of vulns might help me sort of relieve that stress a little bit. Yeah, I sometimes think about it when I'm talking with somebody about the career and back bounty mm -hmm. hunting and doing the YouTube stuff and blah, blah, blah. And sometimes we, we delve into the passive income discussion. Mm. And when I say, you know, when you're hacking, you, you have to be at the front of, in front of the computer. And, and then, yeah, I should probably exclude the automation mm -hmm. guys from this because yeah. they can actually make money passively. Yeah, man, it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, and that was the, big, uh, the fun part of all that. So for, it's great for those hackers that really enjoy writing code, for sure. Yeah. Uh, let's let's come back to live hacking events. Mm. You said that this year was mostly oriented around those hacking events. So for those of us who, who, who haven't attended live hacking events, how does this cycle look like? Yeah, um, well, to be honest, the uh, the flow of the live hacking events, like when they occur and where they're going to be and stuff like that, I, I we you know, sometimes we know in advance, but most of the time we, we just know when HackerOne announces it, like, you know, on their Twitter or via it, sending us invites to our, our emails, right? Um, and so uh, not a lot of planning in advance on that. And that's feedback I've given to HackerOne being like, hey, especially if you want me to come to every event in a year, you know, five or six events in a year, um, I need to know more in advance so I can plan my life a little bit. Um, but yeah, so the typical flow is you, you get an, an email saying, hey, you're invited to the event, here's the details. Sometimes they'll tell you the target then or they'll release the target at a later date. Um, <clears throat> it's going to be in this place. Uh, you're covered for your flight and hotel or you're not covered for your flight and hotel depending on whether you're a, a plus one or whether you're a, a sort of a sponsored hacker. Um, and then... Uh, probably about two weeks before the live hacking event swings around, you get on a scope call. Uh, they announce the scope. They tell you about the bonuses and the cool, um, you know, bounty tables and challenges and that sort of thing they have planned for the event. Then is this called the, the first time when you see what other hackers are invited? Uh, yeah, sort of. But y y you know, it gets around in the community. You know, yeah, yeah, I guess you kind of know. Um, and, and there, there are, uh, you know, people like me and Joel that, that have gone to like every event since like, you know, <laughs> 2018 or something like that. So, um, you oh, know, wow. there, there's, there's, uh, definitely some regulars. Um, 
uh, but yeah, then you have the scope call. You kind of say hey to all your friends, and you kind of decide, hey, am I going to collab or am I not going to collab? And then right after the scope call, the the scope opens normally. So you you know you get the invite and you start hacking. Then it's two weeks of hardcore hacking, um, and this is what's called a this phase is what's called the dupe window. So if anybody finds a a bug that is the same as another bug um, during this period, the bounty is split in half. Um, and so, uh, you know, if I, I, if I find a bug and you find the same bug during that period and that bug is awarded a 2k bounty, then we'll each get a thousand dollars. Uh, but here's a, here's a catch. Here's a little bit of a catch to that, right? Say me and Joel are collaborating and you do it solo, right? That yeah. bug gets split in two. So you get a thousand dollars and then we get a thousand dollars, which then gets split to $500, right? So, um, yeah. there's a lots of, there's lots of dynamics surrounding collaboration, um, and we all know the power of collaboration. It definitely allows you to. St- uh, just, sorry, just to yeah. just to clarify this: if three independent hackers or four independent hackers find a bug, it's split into three or four. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Is there an upper limit? <laughs> for there this? is not, uh, and so uh, I have some emails in my inbox of saying, "Hey, you were awarded a eight dollar bounty or like a four dollar <laughs> bounty," and I'm like, "Thanks, appreciate that." Um, uh, but yeah, so, you know, there's definitely some, some collaboration stuff that needs to be taken into account there. Um, and then after the, the dupe windows over, most of the time people, you know, you'll kind of hit up your friends and you'll be like, Hey, what did you find? And they'll be like, Hey, what did you find? And you kind of share cool bugs. And then, uh, collaboration opens up a lot more at that point, I think, because people have done their initial pass and they're looking to escalate things and they're looking to see the things they missed. And, um, and then, you know, you go to the event. You collab, the bounties start rolling, and uh, and then the award ceremony happens, where you know an MVH is decided. Uh, the MVH is decided, and um, and it's a very it's a very exciting time for sure. Do you usually work alone at live hacking events? Do you collaborate? Are you part of a bigger team? Yeah, man. So. <laughs> I catch a lot of flack for this, actually, but I don't normally collab. The only exception to that is when I have, uh, when Joel decides to take time off of work and and do it full time with me, then I'll do a 50 50 okay. split with Joel because I I know him and I know um, what kind of hacker he is and I I think we complement each other well. But typically for me, I'm going solo for the until the end of the dupe period, and the reason for that is I think I have the ability to find a good amount of bugs um, solo. And like I mentioned before, if you find a bug on a team, not only are, and that bug is duped, not only are, are you getting the dupe split, but you're also getting the collab split, right? So the bounties get a lot lower. So what I prefer to do is I prefer to work solo until the end of the dupe period. And then at the end of the dupe period, I'll collab with other hackers. And then at that point, if we're finding bugs that are unique, then um, we we can submit those together and then just get the 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 full bounty split between the however many of us participated in it and that's been a good that's been a good um, system for me over the past couple of years and I think it maximizes bounty returns and still allows me to see a lot of cool bugs and collaborate with a lot of great hackers. Do you think those dupe windows could work outside live hacking events? Frick, yes, I do. I, I'm so salty right now because of all those dupes I got in that program that I was telling you about when a program launches. I would love yeah. to see HackerOne implement dupe windows in challenges and in, um, uh, you know, just when programs launch because it motivates hackers a lot more. For example, the target that I'm talking about, it launched in the middle of the night for me. And so I, I, I missed a lot of the, um, you know, initial hacking hours on that program and i like to think that's why i got uh you know more dupes than my fair share there um but yeah that i would definitely like to see that be used in other contexts as well what are some other things or features in bug bounty platforms that you'd like to see Mm, that's a good question well i'm lucky enough to have uh had the opportunity to collab directly with designers for hacker one and and for other platforms as well um and give direct feedback on the stuff that i want implemented um and so most of the features that i've really been kind of yearning for have been have been implemented already um 
You know, off the top of my head, the only thing that comes to mind is a little bit more in-depth reporting and a better mobile UI, <laughs> which is a complaint that I've had for a while is that the HackerOne mobile UI is like not great. Um, but I would definitely also... How, how often do you use it on mobile? I use it on mobile to, all, like, respond all the time. To responding to reports? Yeah, responding to reports. And also just, you know, I, I'm out and about and I get an email saying, you know, some, there's some movement on this report. You know, it's like, it's like crack, man. You gotta, you start shaking if you don't open the email <laughs> right away, you know? Um, yeah. So I, I use it on mobile a lot. Okay. Um, coming back to, to live hacking events, imagine the situation that you lose all your bug bounty platform profiles mm -hmm. and you lose all the relationships you have, sure. but you, you keep your skills. Mm. Uh, what's the fastest way to get to a live hacking event? Ooh, that's a good question. If I'm being honest, the fastest way to get to a live hacking event is probably to connect with other hackers that are at the live hacking events. So yeah. um, whether that's, you know, you try to... Well, also, hackers get in... Notable hackers that are in the locality of the event, get, also get invited. So for example, if they're having an event in Washington, DC, I'm an hour from Washington, DC. So I might get an invite there, even though I'm not like, you know, the, the top hacker in general at that point, right? Um, and so, you know, your locality plays, definitely plays a role, but um, your best chance at getting in, I believe is probably to be a, a, a plus one in the, in the beginning, right? And so making friends with somebody that has a plus one and, and asking for a plus one or that sort of thing um, can get you in the door. But then here's the thing. You've got to perform at that event. You know, if you don't, yeah. if you don't rank top 10 at that event, unlikely you're getting back in. Um, and so that, that's kind of how I got into the events in the first place was I was a plus one. And then I, uh, I ranked eighth in my first live hacking event. And then I got invited to the next one. And the next one I had enough time to like fully prepare and and yeah. hack and then i kind of continued ranking in the top 10 for the next live hacking events until i won an mvh and a couple first place trophies and that that kind of secures your place a little bit more <laughs> yeah and also now i i think back to to sort of your hacking style that you don't report as much volume mm. but you go for the impact more yeah. it's probably not the best ways to optimize for reputation points yeah. on those platforms yeah so, so uh, yeah, now, well, now it makes sense for you. But... Let, let, let me clarify that really quickly. Like I report every yeah. bug I find. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Yeah, like, yeah. like every, every, like, you know, if there's a low, I'm going to report that shit all day, you know? Um, <laughs> it, 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 and so it, it's not that I'm not looking for, I'm definitely focusing on impact. I'm trying to achieve impact. Um, but I definitely don't shy away from reporting you know, lows or mediums or anything like that at the expense of spending more time finding highs or criticals. Okay. Yeah. And um, so in the last year, for example, how many programs did you report back to? Dude, very few. Um, let me pull up the data right here. I've got it. All right. So I'm looking here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, probably barely more than 10. Uh, okay. yeah, 11 is kind of where I'm at. Um, so, so very few programs. Um, and, and I think that's a function of me focusing specifically on live hacking event targets and also just not having a lot of time to hack this year because of, um, working on the rental property and some other personal stuff that that's come up. Uh, you know, I've pretty much only been working hard on the live hacking events and then working on, you know, other programs on the side. Yeah. And one, one follow up question to the um, th thing about networking mm -hmm. and in the context of live hacking mm -hmm. events. So for people that don't know anybody, um, they sort of probably follow your podcast, mm. they follow my media on, on Twitter, but they don't know anybody personally, how you think they can build those connections, build those relationships? Yeah, I mean, the best way to build those relationships is by interacting with people in meaningful ways on Twitter and on Discord. 
um, the the uh, or X, excuse me. Uh, you know, the <laughs> the the security community, particularly the bug bounty community, is pretty active on X on Twitter, um, and so definitely be involved in that environment. Um, uh, Discord as well. I'm personally, I personally have a really hard time keeping up with Discord. There, Joel, yeah, Joel lives in Discord. Joel like is all over the place in, in Discord. He's in every Discord server. He's like pretty actively responding to stuff. And I just, I don't know how he does it. Um, but uh, for me, it, it's Twitter. And and like for example, let me let me give you someone to to look up to about this rezo does a really good job of this right he's he's constantly engaging in in discords he's constantly engaging on twitter he's adding meaningful stuff to the conversation um and yeah i mean it, uh, everyone knows him everyone takes notice of that and uh and yeah. so it's definitely especially if your goal is to get to a live hacking event the uh there is definitely some some social aspect of it as well Okay, and um, also in in one of the um, I think two or three episodes ago, you talked about the mentorship with mm. two of your students. Mm. What did you learn while teaching them? What what were the mistakes that um, they did that you maybe didn't expect? Yeah, well, um, you know, one of the things that they talked about in the in the uh, in that podcast was this concept of joshikihara, which is a term that they coined in Japanese, uh, which essentially means like common sense harassment. Uh, but essentially, what there's there's a there's a term for it already apparently called the curse of knowledge, which we found out afterwards. But essentially, once you've been in an environment and you've had a set of knowledge for so long, it's kind of hard for you to consider what life is like without that knowledge and, and that, yeah. that other people may not have that knowledge. Um, and, and so uh, I definitely found that I need to be a little bit more thorough with my explanations, especially since I've been doing this you know, since I was 12 or 13. So most of my life, most of my cognizant life, um, I've been doing this. Um, so it's a little bit hard for me to put myself in their in their shoes um i also learned the importance of the socratic method which is um essentially teaching via asking questions or and also just a variant on that which is teaching via you know teaching and then having them teach it back to you that that has a lot of value okay. oh yeah um and yeah. and you if they can't teach it back to you correctly then they don't fully understand it um and so uh, that's definitely a high value, a high value principle as well. Yeah, and and for for the audience here that uh, don't have any mentor, mm. and and most of most of the audience that doesn't have, don't don't have any mentor, don't write a DM to Justin to mentor <laughs> you because he won't. That's that's one point, <laughs> and the second is. Uh, you can also implement sort of learning by asking questions when you just publish stuff on your blog or on Twitter. Mm. You, you Simply you can write about anything that you learn, uh, some experience you had, some challenge you solved, some anything that's, that's sort of in your learning journey. Mm, because I know it from, from the beginning of the channel, like the beginning of, of my channel mm. was basically this, was basically, oh, I think this report is cool and I think I understand it. But when I started to actually make a video about it, I was a lot of the times realizing I did mm -hmm. not understand it at all. It was only s scratching the surface. So it's a really, really good way to actually understand it because you are also prepared for other people to, to sort of read it. So you want to make sure that, um, that you will not be wrong here in a stupid way. Mm. So, so it's, it's really, really yeah, good. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. And, and just to echo, you know, even if you don't understand something fully, or if you can't fully exploit something, or you just find some weird quirk, you can blog about that. You can write about that. You can tweet about that. And, uh, you know, people from the community it, will sort of come along and be like, ah, oh, that's interesting, or now nah, here's the solution for that. That's easy, you know, that sort of thing. And either way, you learn. Um, so that's really cool. And, and just going back to the mentorship note, um, like, like you pointed out, Greg, I, I would love to, <laughs> to mentor all of you, but I get way too many mentorship requests and I can't even handle responding to my DMs, let alone, you know, establishing a mentor relationship with people. So, um, I would definitely encourage people to, 
check out the pinned tweet that I've got on how to on how to you know essentially go from zero to 100k in bug bounty. Um, that kind of lays out a little bit of a of a flow on it. And also, like you said, um, collaborate. You know, put stuff out for the community. You don't always need a mentor. Um, sometimes you just need somebody to motivate you to be uh, your hacking partner. If you look at like Shubs and Nafi, the, the reason they both had a lot of success in the industry, both of them would, would cred, credit largely to the competition between the two of them, trying to outperform each other, trying to, you know, figure out how, how did he do that? You know, that sort of thing. Um, that sort of competition is really good for growth as well. Yeah. And, uh, one other thing that that you mentioned in in that episode was that i think it was that mm. episode that full-time back bounty hunter should have a grind mentality mm. can you explain what did you mean <sighs> it's a little bit tricky with that um and i guess that's largely contextually dependent i i'm not 100 percent sure that that's for everyone but uh, at the end of the day um this is not an easy, an easy job to do, uh, being a full-time yeah. bug bounty hunter. And there's going to be a lot of time where you are frustrated with dupes or you're frustrated like, like I am right now, uh, or you're frustrated with, you know, how much income you made, or maybe this web application is just, you know, beating you up and you can't find any vulns on it, you know, and it just feels like you're getting punched in the gut. Um, and so it's important to, persevere through that and realize that that's all part of the journey. And as I'm saying this, I, I'm preaching to myself here because, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's hard to live that out. And I, I struggle with that today and yesterday. Um, and oftentimes there's, there's periods of relief from that where I'm not really thinking about it, but the times when it does happen, um, it's very important to rely on your friends for encouragement, rely on your, on your, you know, significant other, um, rely on your, your religion for me, my relationship with Jesus, um, to get that, that extra boost you need to kind of push through. Yeah. And, uh, you also mentioned your, your wife, mm. Mar Mariah, I yep, think that's right. you, you spell it a bit differently than we do. We have the same name in Poland, but we spell it differently. That's why I sort of, yeah, yeah. It's M A R I A H and, but almost everyone writes it Maria. Uh, you know, yeah. without the H at the end. So she responds to both. <laughs> okay. But um, my question is, how can uh, a partner of a bug bounty hunter support a bug bounty hunter? And the intention of this question is for bug bounty hunters out there <laughs> to show it to their partners. <laughs> well, I should probably have Mariah over here to talk about it. Um, and, and I think I will do a podcast episode with her sometime to kind of talk about this topic. But um, I think Mariah is a very data driven person and a very, um, uh, practical person. And so when she looks at the data and she says, Hey, Justin, you've been making more money from bug bounty doing part-time than you have been, you know, full-time bug bounty or full-time job. Uh, you should definitely go full-time bug bounty. And that's just a very obvious choice for her. And she's very confident in that decision. And so that helps reassure me. Um, so her confidence in that sort of thing and her confidence in the fact that bug bounty is not a skill that you just lose, <laughs> which is somehow something yeah. that doesn't get into our heads as, as hackers, you yeah. know, I've been doing this five years and when I take a three month break or whatever, or a two month break or something like that, and I come back, I feel rusty as heck. And I'm like, man, that's it. I don't got it anymore. Like, you know, this is the <laughs> end, you know? And, and Mariah's yeah. like, you are so silly right now. Like, just, just go, just go hack stuff for a week. You'll be fine. Um, she's very encouraging in that regard. And then also just practical stuff as well. Like, you know, when, when I'm, when I'm hacking, um, she knows that I'm in the zone. So I'm not as emotional when I respond or emotive in any way. You know, sometimes I talk like a robot and she's understands that that's just cause I'm in the zone. And sometimes I forget to eat and she'll bring me, you know, healthy food. And, <laughs> and sometimes I forget to drink water and she'll bring me water. And so, um, you know, those sort of things really mean a lot to me. They, they really um, show love very strongly. And uh, I don't know how I would do it, do it without her. So. 
yeah so i'd really love to to listen to an episode with her so it's a great idea and um and now let's let's go to to the next part where uh let's talk about critical thinking mm. and the first question is why to share your knowledge when you could just keep it for yourself yeah that's a great question man uh my dad asks me this every single time I see him because he's like, don't, <laughs> don't give away the hacking secrets. Like, this is your secret sauce. Don't share it, you know? Um, and I understand what he's saying from, like, the perspective of, um, you know, trying to protect my income and not sharing it with competitors and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, um, the only reason I learned to hack as well as I have is because people have shared stuff. Um, it would have been very hard for me to go from zero to this is, you know, now I understand how to hack things. Um, so one of it, a part of it is giving back to the community. But um, another piece of it is just that I want other people to succeed. And it's one of my greatest joys in life to see, a, uh, you know, somebody who's learning bug bounty um, sort of grasp a, a topic and become very excited about it. And I wish I could do that individually with each and every person, you know, like, like you said, the people reaching out to me to get mentored. Um, I would love to mentor each and every one of you. If, and I had, if I had the time, I would do it. Um, because it, it brings me so much joy to see ideas click and vulnerabilities found, but, um, I don't. And so I figured I would do this more at scale via, via a podcast. And, um, yeah, I think there's also something to just be said for having an audience. Um, that's very helpful for, uh, I guess, being uh, respected in the industry. And it's very helpful for um, if I wanted to start any businesses in the future, launching it from having an audience is way better than launching it from not having an audience. So, yeah. um, and then the, the final thing is, I always wanted a bug bounty podcast that, that brings... <laughs> sort of the conversation, the awesome conversations and connections you have with other hackers at the live hacking events that brings that, you know, to our every single week. And so that's kind of what we're shooting for with the podcast is like, let's talk about this stuff at a very high level, at, at, at a level um, where, you know, if you're not at that level, then you have a, a good picture of what it looks like. And if you are at that level, then this is intellectually engaging for you. And, um, and you can uh, enjoy that from an intellectual perspective. So that's kind of what we're shooting for. Yeah, that's great. Where does the name come from, the critical thinking back when you put Yeah, this? it's a little bit, <laughs> the name is a little bit, a little bit weird, man, because like from an SEO perspective, like very hard to rank for critical thinking, right? Um, but the name was actually generated by the early versions of ChatGPT. Um, and, and essentially what I said was like, Hey, we're going to do a bug bounty podcast. We'd like, you know, some, some cool engaging sort of punny name maybe. And we gave it a bunch of terms that are related to the industry and it came up with critical thinking. And, and I was like, the other one that, that was kind of in our, in our, um, that was an option is, was like, uh, I think it was like bounty bites or something like that. Or maybe it's like, uh. Yeah, I believe that was it. But that sounded too short. You know, we were going to do an hour, hour and a half long podcast. So uh, that wasn't really long enough. Um, yeah. And so we landed on critical thinking as a pun for thinking about critical vulnerabilities. Um, and actually, we are starting yeah. to rank for it. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Does the podcast make any money or do you sort of lose money on it? No, I lose money on it every single month. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, we're in the stages of monetizing it now. Uh, we have some really exciting ideas, both for the community and for uh, <laughs> our wallets, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, regarding the podcast. So um, you, you can definitely expect in the future um, a critical thinking discord to open up with, uh, uh, that under, under Joel's diligent, uh, you know, discord skills, um, <laughs> that, that will have some discord subscriptions. We'll have, um, we're working to develop some really awesome swag. We're not going to do any mid swag. Like this is going to be awesome swag. Um, we're working on that. And then we're also working with various companies to sponsor the podcast um, and, and try to get 
that going on a regular basis so yeah that's great because you, you really do a, a good job and i think it was definitely a, a missing piece in the in the industry so you definitely deserve to to, to at least not not lose it every, <laughs> Thanks, every month. Yeah, you know, I, I, and I also I want to get it to a point where I can just focus on the content because right now I'm doing like a bunch of social media stuff and I'm doing a bunch of administrative stuff and that sort of thing. Um, and I'm paying money for it to be edited every every month, um, and it's definitely worth it. But at some point, I would like to have the podcast income covering all of that. And, and, you know, allow me to hire someone to do social media and just focus on me developing the content. And I think that's when critical thinking is really going to start. The quality of the episodes will, will go up a lot because I'll be, have more time to devote to actually crafting the content. Yeah. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's going to be great. And, uh, when you create the, the private discord, I, I will be the, the first ah, customer. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. <laughs> Yeah, every single time you mention uh, BBR Premium on, on Twitter, I just get uh, instantly, instantly uh, subscriptions coming in. So, <laughs> so th thank you, thank you for this. I'm glad. I'll have to, I'll have to do that on a regular basis then. <laughs> okay, Justin, thank you so much for joining me today. I think we we covered a broad range of topics, and I think there are a lot of uh, things for for viewers that they can sort of save in uh, in their in their heads probably maybe in their notes for the more note taking type viewers uh, so thank you for this very interesting conversation of course man thanks for having me on justin gave me and you loads of useful background tea tips but if you are still hungry for more subscribe to the critical thinking background tea podcast and check out for example this episode with alex chapman also Black Friday is coming and don't miss it because it's the only BBR premium promotion for the whole year. To find out more, go to bbre.dev premium.